Welcome everybody, we might uh, make a start. Um, thank you very much for coming. This is the third and final event for Open Access Week 2024. My name is Janet Catterall and I'm the Senior Project Officer for Open Access Australasia. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, the land of the Gimoy Wollaburi Dingy, which is the Gimoy Cairns in far north Queensland. And just get my screen up. Um, Open Access Australasia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We also pay our respects to all Indigenous people, wherever they are in the world, especially including the Na'iwi Māori, the Tagata Whenua of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I invite you all to um, just pop in the chat uh, where you're calling in from today. I'd like to um, pass you to Kim Tyree now. She's the chair of the Open Access Australasia Executive Committee, and uh, she's going to do an opening karakia for us. Thank you, Kim. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Uh, me i noi tātou. Tuia ki te rangi, tuia ki te whenua, tuia ki te ira tangata, ka rongo te pō, ka rongo te au, tuturu whakamaua, Kia tina, huie, taikie. Uh, kia ora tātou e te whanau o OAA, uh, ki ti honga mātei kua fiturangitia e moi e moi ki au ti moi e kore rawa koutou e wariwari tia uh, ki nga iwi kainga o te whenua, uh, ka nui te mihi, always was, always will be. Uh, ka nui te mihi, uh, ki te āriki nui kuini uh, nā wai hono i te pōa rirei, rirei hau pai mā rirei. Uh, ka nui te hari i tō koutou māia ki te uh, tautoko o tēnei kōrero rero. I tika ana te kōrero i uh, tātou tūpuna. Uh, he hā te kai o te rangatera, he kōrero, he kōrero, he kōrero. Uh, nō reira. In a mana uh, it fano e hikama, tina koto, tina koto, tina koto katoa. Uh, ko kim tidy aho, he uri aho, uh, no waikato tainui, he kai toha poka aho, uh, kiti wananga arunui, otamaki makoro, uh, wai hoki, he kai hotu, tariti aho, uh, nata mia, he kui aho, toitu te tariti. Uh, and I also acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the unceded land uh, on uh, which we live and work today, always was, always will be. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Kim. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. The session is being recorded, as you probably will be aware. Um, we will be sharing it uh, under a CC BY license as soon as we have it edited and up on the website. So that will probably be next week. Um, please mute your microphone. And um, we will be taking questions from the audience. We should have plenty of time for a good, uh, robust discussion uh, after our speakers have done their initial uh, presentations. Um, we'd ask that you use Slido if possible, and the link, a direct link, will be provided in the chat throughout the session. This is just so that if um, usually chat has a, a bit of a conversation going on on the side, and we don't want to risk losing any questions in the chat. So if you can use the Slido, um, that way we can make sure we get to hopefully get to everyone's questions for our really amazing speakers today. So our session is uh, communities contextualized how can technologies support communities and their decisions around opening their knowledges and uh, kim is going to chair this session and she will be introducing the panelists now i just wanted to um, make note of the fact that one of our uh, panelists yanti is not able to be with us today but i wanted to acknowledge the work that she had done in uh, creating this session with us so i will now turn it back to kim Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Janet. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you all today to celebrate Open Access Week. 
Um, as I said in my introduction, I'm Kim Tidy. I'm the University Librarian at AUT, and uh, I work in the Tiriti Strategy Office uh, one day a week. And um, it's uh, always a great opportunity to come together with communities of practice and people interested in open access. And um, I quite often am very fortunate that I get to chair the Indigenous panels, um, which is something that, uh, as you all know, um, is something that is uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of years in the making, the knowledges that are going to be represented today. And so uh, it's an absolute pleasure. And I uh, am looking forward to introducing the panel. Um, First, we have uh, Lee Timu Timu, uh, who is uh, an advocate and voice for Māori in digital and tech. Then we have Ryan Stoker, who is the team leader at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Data Archives at UTS. And uh, then we also have Leslie Akers, the manager of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Services and Collections at UQ, University of Queensland. And so what we're doing is we're giving each of our panelists about five minutes to introduce themselves and talk a bit about their, their mahi, their work, what's important to them. And then we'll go into uh, the questions and then open up to uh, you, the participants, uh, to ask your own questions. Kapai, that means good, all good, ready to go. So over to you first, Lee. Uh, tēnā koe koe, uh, kia ora mātou uh, uh, rakia, tēnei koe, uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Um, kia ora everyone, um, ko ai ahau, who am I? Ko li timu timu tōku ingoa, uh, he uri ahau nō Ngā Te Awanga i te rangi tūhoe me Ngā Te Parau, uh, nō mā tātua waka ahau, ko pūtaua ki te maunga, ko ohine mataro te awa, ko ngai tai whakaia te hapu, ko tai whakaia te marae, ko Ngā Te Awa i te iwi, everyone. My name is Lee. Um, I was born in a place uh, on, on the east coast of the North Island called Whakatane, born and raised where my mother and her whanau raised me. Um, I currently live in Kirikiriroa, also known as Hamilton, uh, which is in the North Island of the Waikato region, uh, with, here with my wife and four kids. Um, I guess um, I've got a couple of slides that I wanted to share. It's really just to drop you into uh, some of the mahi that I I do, and it's it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of mahi, I guess. But um, yeah, anyways, we'll see how we go, right? Let's see. Um, hopefully you're all seeing my um slide there with my picture on. I can't see myself, but it's all good. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I'm an Indigenous uh, uh, person from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, I'm also uh, an advocate and voice for Māori and digital and technology here in our country, um, which sees me doing a lot of cool, cool mahi, actually. Um, these are just some of the, uh, I guess, kaupapa or initiatives and organisations that I've uh, had a hand in, uh, either founding or co-founding. Um, essentially, um, I've helped to found um, some of our leading community advocacy groups in the Māori digital and technology community. Uh, it's a very small community uh, here in NZ, 4.8% uh, Māori representation in technology at the minute. Um, but, you know, we're looking at, um, we're doing a lot of work in increasing that that number and also uh, representation of Māori in this uh, tech sector. I'm also uh, the founder of an initiative called Kumari Hangarau, which is essentially a rangatahi uh, Technology Summit, uh, which has been going for the last five ne years now. I'm also uh, the lead claimant of a treaty claim that's currently in front of the Waitangi Tribunal, uh, Y3311, which essentially spotlights digital equity for Māori communities. So that's um, just a couple of the portai or hats that I wear. Um, these two um, initiatives in particular, um, I'll be referencing throughout my responses and through the portal that I present. Uh, to this uh, to this uh, hui today, or this meeting today. Uh, the first one is called Marae Matiko. Essentially, it's a Marae digital literacy program that uh, we've been delivering into our Marae uh, communities for the last uh, three, maybe four years. Uh, real um, a pri privilege to be doing that sort of mahi, and, and really that's provided us with an opportunity to connect with our uh, communities at flat roots level or ground, ground roots level. 
uh, and really um, find out what some of the challenges and issues are for them in terms of this ever-increasing uh, digital uh, world that we uh, that we live in today. So there's a few uh, conversations and a lot of research that we've done within that uh, community in particular that will lend itself to some of the, the, the thoughts or kafala that I'll share today with you all. Uh, and the second, uh, I guess, initiative is a very recent, uh, very new one, but essentially it's uh, looking at delivering uh, affordable, fast internet into low-income uh, communities or lower socioeconomic communities, low-income households, and it's really just trying to, one way that we're trying to do, to uh, resolve the digital divide here in New Zealand, uh, which is a very real thing for us, and I'm, no doubt it's it's a, it's a challenge and an issue over there across, uh, across the Tasman, um, but yeah, some of the real world life and practical experiences that I have, uh, I have experienced uh, within these two particular initiatives at, at, uh, on the screen here, are uh, certainly some things that I'll be touching on today. So I don't come from a, a library uh, uh, background uh, or an information system background. I come from a background of having worked in IT for the last 30, uh, 25 years, sorry, not quite 30 yet, but uh, 25 <laughs> years, and uh, also uh, through my mahi as uh, leading advocate and voice for uh, Māori and Digitech, and finally as an advocate and, and a very loud voice for digital equity uh, for Māori here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'll hand it back to you, Kim. Thank you. Kia ora. Thanks very much for that, Lee. And um, you can see from Lee's um, slides when he talks about his mahi that he's talking about rangatahi, so our young people right up to all our communities and being in our communities with iwi talking about what they really need, which is often a picture that our governments and funders don't get because they're so far away from communities. So it's nice to hear that um, that grassroots advocacy um, is being picked up in this uh, panel. So uh, next uh, to Ryan Stoker. Um, Ryan, take it away. Thanks, Kim. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ryan Stoker. I'm uh, uh, Wadri um, from uh, up northwestern New South Wales um, around the Dubbo, um, around Dubbo. Um, up that way. Um, so connections there with um, uh, my clans, uh, Ryan's and Riley's. I um, always joke that uh, any time um, I think if I was to take my mum's surname, I'd be Ryan Ryan. Um, but a uh, bit, bit of a bad joke there. Um, but um, I'd also just like to acknowledge um, um, that I was born um, on, on Bindigal country in Sydney um, and acknowledging um, that I now live and work on Gadigal country and that um, and acknowledging country um, and living, working and being sustained by it. Um, so my role is um, team leader for um, a small archive called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Data Archive. Um, and what we are is basically um, a small archive that was set up around 2008 um, by the university librarian at the time, Dr. Alex Byrne, and um, the head of the John Bunner Institute at the time, Dr. Martin Nakata. Um, and it was essentially to uh, address a question that was happening in um, the academic um, uh, institution space around research data and uh, that acknowledging that there was a lot of great work being done um, with communities um, and uh, by uh, really deadly uh, First Nations academics, um, but then uh, addressing the question of what would happen with research data after the end of a project. Um, often, more often than not, it was sort of tend to be put onto an archive or, or like a hard drive or a um, or a computer network server and um, then just kept there um, and preserved or not really well preserved um, <laughs> depending on depending on who was maintaining it but um, essentially just sitting in people's offices um, uh, and um, uh, being kept in there so uh, essentially what we were um, what the project was uh, initially developed around was to identify those data sets um, and uh, very much repatriating those back to community and repatriating back to community. So uh, identifying data sets, um, providing uh, culturally appropriate storage for it um, that, um, that was sort of professionally maintained um, to standards 
uh, and then ultimately with the end goal of working with researchers and communities to uh, return that data back, um, provide support to community around uh, using those research data sets as part of um, uh, part of addressing challenges and um, opportunities facing in communities, um, and basically empowering communities as well to make decisions around how that data is accessed, stored and used as well. Um, so very much at the core of our, um, our principles is um, uh, respect, um, trust and engagement. So, um, and it's a foundational for what we do with um, anything from our infrastructure to technology. Um, the first and foremost is just ultimately um, we're respecting um, culture, um, we're respecting ways of knowing and doing, um, and we're respecting, um, respecting our mobs um, decision making in terms of um, how data is accessed, stored and reused. Um, uh, so it's not just sitting with me or um, with a researcher. Um, part of our requirements for our, da our data deposits, for instance, is that we um, ensure that there's sort of free prior informed consent from communities um, and communities have an active involvement in terms of um, uh, providing um, access conditions and providing further information about data sets. Um, and then also then um, ensuring that our infrastructure is trustworthy um, and, um, and that in terms of um, industry standards, but also making sure that there's culturally appropriate storage and access as well. Um, so making sure that we have strong relationships with the communities um, that we have, um, ensuring that um, our, um, oh, and making sure that our infrastructure follows COP protocol as well. So for instance, um, with our storage, um, we have certain parts of that storage which are, um, uh, which only certain people can access, um, depending on the permissions made by the community. Um, and then also just respecting and um, uh, respecting the moral rights of researchers and, um, and communities and respecting ICIP, um, Indigenous cultural and electoral property rights as well. And then finally around engagement, building those relationships with community, uh, providing access to data sets, um, and then ultimately as well returning um, data sets back to community and assisting with um, communities around uh, building um, building up um, uh, either cultural archives um, themselves on their own community um, or um, providing that space there for that temporary storage until um, we return, um, until communities are ready to, to have that data back, back home on country. Um, so that keeps me quite busy in terms of a lot of relationship building and um, and I think in terms of um, my positionality today with this panel session is talking around trust and relationship building, um, respecting um, and that sort of um, interface between um, uh, archival practice and um, and making and ensuring that it does respect um, our ways of knowing and doing. Thank you very much, Ryan. I think the heart at um, all that we do in this space is what we call in Aotearoa um, whakawhanaungatanga. It's um, relationship building um, and it's uh, kind of one of the key parts of that and you've picked up on it, Ryan, is the the reciprocity. So if people give you their knowledge, then what are we giving back in return as cultural organisations? And how do we make sure that at some point when our communities are ready, then they have sovereignty over their own data and they decide and they, you know, really what we want is our iwis, our nations, not to have to need us at all, that they can have their own data on country. So thank you very much for that. And next up, we have Leslie. Thanks, Kim. Hi, my name's Leslie Akers. I am calling in from the unceded lands of Yagara and Turrbal country. And I'd like to um, pay my respects to um, ancestors and country and to all First Nations uh, people who are calling um, in today. Um, I am Bidra and Kari on my mother's side. My mother's country is Springshaw and Carnarvon Gorge area in central Queensland Highlands. And then on my father's side, I am a descendant of um, Batagul and Mabuel people in the Torres Strait Islands. Um, I was born on Yagara and Turrbal land uh, where I've worked and uh, lived all my life. Um, I have spent the last 11 years working in libraries. I began my career at State Library Queensland, where I worked with a network of 26 Indigenous knowledge centres in Queensland. They are their community libraries um, in those remote communities. 
I worked with them for 10 years and learnt the issues and challenges around connecting communities to colonial institutions um, and collecting institutions, not only in Queensland, but Australia-wide. I also um, use my lived experiences as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person trying to navigate these institutions to be able to conduct my own, leaf, my own family research, um, to be able to then teach people in communities um, as well as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who used to come and visit, who come and visit the library. Um, from there, I, the last two years, I um, joined um, University of Queensland Library where they have established a first dedicated Indigenous um, team. And I've made the switch to academic libraries, which I'm learning all about. Um, and also bringing with me my network of um, Indigenous knowledge centres and community people to enable them to access academic libraries such as Fryer Library and UQ Library um, to use as a place of research. <clears throat> the, that's been my drive for the whole 11 years working um, in this space is also ensuring that libraries are a safe space for our mobs to come in and visit, but also to share that knowledge of how it is for an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person to actually navigate um, these institutions. Also helping uncover what is held in these institutions and being able to be given the opportunity to update metadata and catalogue records and actually do cultural assessments on them to be able to then accurately describe to improve that accessibility has been my focus here at University of Queensland Library. But more importantly, as I audit the collections here, are we looking at now delivering um, these collections in a digital format on technology to communities on country? And that's the name of the project, Collections on Country. I can talk more about that. Uh, it's the first time that the library's ever embarked on this journey and it is a pilot project, so it's in early um, stages, but very excited um, to be doing this work and um, helping UQ Library to be able to deliver um, an initiative such as this. So that's me. Namahi uh, Nui, thank you very much, Leslie. And it's, um, it's great to kind of hear your journey from you know from different kinds of libraries and the and all those people that are still on your journey with you to UQ and I'm sure lots of other people have joined your journey as well now that you're taking these you know what uh, physical artifacts back out into community um, through digital platforms so I'm really looking forward to hearing more um, we do have some questions, and I think the first question that I'm going to ask of Ryan um, kind of speaks to some of the stuff that you just touched on, Leslie, about things being open as possible and described in a way that makes sense to the communities that the knowledge originated from. And so with open access and Indigenous communities have... Um, what could be perceived as a mismatch where sharing of knowledge is concerned. Um, the principle of as open as possible and as closed as necessary is perhaps a way of aligning with that need for Indigenous communities to have, as Ryan said, to closed areas um, that aren't open to everybody um, to protect knowledge's custom and data. And that's why good metadata is really important when they're being described. Um, and I'm going to go to you first, uh, um, Brian. Does this idea work in practice in your archive? 
Um, I think to start off with, um, the concept around as open as possible, as close as necessary, I think it's a good, um, I guess, sort of starting point um, in terms of um, uh, ensuring that we're sort of um, not providing too many um, roadblocks in terms of um, our mob um, accessing, um, uh, like as I said, um, resources um, being held by institutions um, um, and being able to reuse those. Um, and particularly around um, the right to know um, about what institutions hold um, about our mob um, and about um, all communities um, across the, um, uh, all Indigenous communities as well. Um, that being said, I think it does, um, uh, like I think it's a really good concept um, and frame of mind, um, but also I think um, there needs to be a little bit of an asterisk in terms of, um, in terms of that as well and, and just sort of addressing sort of nuances around um, um, First Nations um, uh, research data. Um, and um, I guess it's sort of um, making, I guess it's sort of a sort of point around um, being as open as possible, um, close as necessary, but um, ensuring that, um, that um, community have a say in what is open um, and what is closed um, and um, ensuring that they're sort of making those decisions and working with community around that. So um, I guess because um, usually when we talk about this in training, um, and often training I do um, in previous jobs and in my current job now, we talk about this um, this concept and it's very much incumbent on, on, a, on a particular researcher or a research team to make those decisions. But um, when you're looking at um, when you're looking at uh, working with First Nations communities, it is a collective decision around that. So, um, so I think it's sort of um, there's very much that nuance around that. Um, that being said, as well, um, I always take a bit of a broad interpretation of um, open as possible um, and making sure that metadata is open as possible. Um, we're using um, very much. Um, uh, uh, accessible wording around our descriptions um, in our collections, um, how to access it um, as well, um, and making sure that that's quite consistent and, and very much um, open there because um, uh, for us in, in archives and that we're very much well aware of what an access condition might mean, but for someone, um, and even, even for myself when I visit other archives, um, trying to figure out um, what, what an access condition might mean, um, it often, often requires a very long conversation about that. So, so I guess it's sort of um, having that open, see, um, open and transparency around how to access material, um, um, uh, what are the cultural protocols around that, um, and also acknowledging that this is quite flexible as well, um, is that um, things that might be open originally um, will be closed um, or may be closed at some point, um, uh, or might or things that might be closed might might open um, as well. So it's just making sure that we're sort of um, um, with that as well that it's sort of being maintained and updated. Um, I guess my final thought around that as well is um, uh, that. Um, uh, that there also needs to be, um, I guess, sort of a flexibility um, around that um, in terms of yeah, um, in terms of those sort of um, access conditions, but um, but also just sort of the implications of open access as well. So um, as we all know, once something's out on the um, out, out on the internet, especially nowadays with AI, um, it is a um, it is sort of um, open um, for anyone to use or reuse. Um, and you can put as many licenses as you like on there, but it's very much incumbent on people actually um, interpreting those licenses and using them. So um, as well, I think it's um, about having conversations around um, if you are making something open access, um, what are the implications around that and having that and ensuring that communities have informed, like have all the information that they need to be able to um, have that. So I guess it's sort of, yeah, um, my, my, photo, my final thought around that is open as possible, close as necessary with, with our community and with informed consent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, Leslie or Lee, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, this is really interesting for me as well. Um, um, it's, it's a learning learning process to hear um, uh, what Ryan's shared from the perspective of a library or an information institution or uh, or even in the GLAM space as well. And I'll be keen to see um, and hear some of Leslie's thoughts too. But I think, um, you know, o open access, and again, this is coming from, let's say, an external perspective uh, from someone that's a practitioner in the digital and technology space and think about the doers or the implementers, the people that can build the solutions that you need to enable 
uh, uh, what you what 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 you want um, your system to do. But I do think about things like, um, and this is a very deep conversation. Um, but data data sovereignty is an important. Um, I think in, in all of this, data sovereignty uh, is important. Um, and without deep diving into that rabbit hole, um, probably more so from, from, in my experience, from the perspective of community and the community that you're seeking to serve, particularly those communities that own a lot of this uh, taonga or, or these treasures that, that we as institutions are caretaking, if, if, I might, if I might go so far to say that we're caretaking these taonga and these treasures. Um, so uh, what's, what's the community... Um, um, what is their perspective of these solutions that we're, we're we're enacting and that we're empowering and we're enabling through this thing called technology? Is that important? It's definitely important. But how do we engage our community at that ground roots le ground roots level to ensure that we're on the right track as we're doing all of this important mahi? Yes, it's really important to um, build those uh, relationships with with communities and to and not just uh, transactional relationships but long enduring relationships that have an intergenerational approach etc cetera, etc cetera. so these are all things that are kind of common sense to us as indigenous peoples but you know um but i do come back to and this is really what, what i guess what i'm what, what i'm sharing or what i'm provoking is um what what do our communities think about this this important work that we're we're doing and and and, and are we on the right track yes let's just leave it there I agree, Lee. Um, with all the work that I've done with communities and continue to do, I've seen where collections have been locked up for the wrong reasons and it's because of the inability for the um, communities to actually even access their own um, information about their cultural heritage um, you know, due to copyright holders and what they enforce. So, I mean, the language is very interesting around this about open access and, you know, whether it be closed and, you know, uh, we're protecting um, our knowledges. But you need to look at that in what context because we have, cult we have laws and we have um, knowledges as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people working in these institutions, we have a cultural responsibility to care for these in collaboration with the communities and the peoples that they are about. So it's always done with them not without them and for far too long this has this work has been done without Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander input. So Indigenous governance um, in these institutions is required. You need Indigenous people working in these institutions to actually help guide this work. What is open access? What is restricted or mediated or whatever terminology um, we place on there, but it is because of the specific reason, not because we're gatekeepers or we are merely custodians and that is in consultation with communities. And if you're not doing that work now, it's about auditing those collections and engaging with your local communities to be able to determine what is open access and what needs to be mediated or restricted for cultural reasons. Um, it's, that's a really good segue into, because you've all touched on talking about communities. And I think the question around when building relationships with communities, how do you position yourself um, with regards to community and other stakeholders? And um, are you representing their views? Are you engaging with a spokesperson for that community? We've touched on the fact that community is a collective and the, um, the institutional way is often dealing with one person. So it's a, it's a much more complex engagement when you're dealing with community. Um, or are there other ways that you approach it? We might go start with you this time, Leslie. 
Thanks, Kim. Um, as I tell everyone, what I do in Palm Island in Queensland will be different to um, how I consult people on Thursday Island. So every community is different. Every community has their own protocols. Um, so when I position myself with taking a project um, out to a community, it's about advising, letting community know this is what the library would like to do. Is this something that the community would be interested in? Yes or no? That's the first question because it might not be a priority for it, for the community. So if not, then ask what would be a priority? What is a priority for the community? Um, I've always seen myself as an advocate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people accessing records in institutions. So I have always been uh, worked in positions of being a conduit in um, advocating, collecting all the views of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients and communities and advising the library and working to come up with a solution that will work for communities and also um, sharing that knowledge through a lot of cultural learning has to happen um, with my non-Indigenous colleagues for them to understand the Indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing when we look at our Indigenous worldview perspective on how we look at records. Um, we don't see them as pieces of paper. We don't see them. They're actually part of a community, part of a kinship structure because they hold knowledges that belong to our ancestors. So positioning myself is, is something that I do and have to adjust depending on whether it be a, an, in, a, um, in a regional, remote or in an island in the Torres Strait and follow the necessary protocols. Um, thanks, Leslie. It's, um, I, it's a common theme, this positioning and the, and the thing around it, it's not being one size fits all. And I really want to pick up on that point that um, these knowledges, they're not just artifacts. They're actually part of our DNA. They're our family. They, we are related to them. And so that's one of the things that can be very difficult for people in cultural institutions to understand that don't have an indigenous lens is this is actually our whakapapa, this is our genealogy. And that's why um, we feel so strongly about whatever we, we do is culturally appropriate. So I'm gonna throw um, to Lee or Ryan, and it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on positionality and what you take with you when you go into different communities to work with them. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely run before yeah, before you do. Um, yeah, I guess if I if I can reuse uh, if I can reuse a phrase or a statement that um Atifai Tebel has often um been heard saying um and that is be prepared to take a journey of a thousand cups of tea, um and and that's that expression has been said in in multiple in many different ways, but essentially be prepared for for a journey, um and be prepared to take as long as you need to take for the community to be okay with it, it was what you are presenting to them and eventually what you hope to be partnering with them on. And I meant, and I use the word intentionally partnership. So, um, you know, it's not, um, it's not consultancy. It's not advisory. It's, it's, it truly is a journey of partnership. And so I think with that uh, being said, I think that's an incredibly important thing that I take into any sort of community engagement or community activation or community interaction that I that I do 
with the with the various uh, hats that I wear, and, and and there's many, but essentially I work, operate in that digital literacy space. And that right now, that's a big that's a big challenge for Indigenous communities here in New Zealand. Uh, not only digital literacy, but also uh, access to affordable internet uh, is another big thing. And you think about it, um, you know, if you think from a technology perspective and and thinking about open access, we provide them with digital access to these digital platforms. Well, how on earth are they going to access those digital platforms if they don't have an internet connection? Now, these are the very practical things that are actually big barriers for Indigenous communities, uh, largely lower socioeconomic communities, where um, you know where where internet is actually not a thing because it's not affordable. So, how if you solve that problem, then you're going to then create that accessibility to this important treasure trove of digital uh, data, digital tongue that you do want those communities to interact with. So I guess that's just a really um, um, practical and relevant challenge, I think, for, that faces many of our uh, communities today. So uh, I think that's probably one thing I could share. Thanks, Lee. Ryan, do you have anything to add? Um... I think I'm very much in the same um, same boat as Leslie and, and Lee. It's um, uh, those relationship buildings. They do take a very long time, um, um, and uh, they are um, they are very unique in terms of um, who who you do interact with, um, and and even with the projects themselves. Um, uh, it's always um, and it's always something that I have to um, communicate as well. Is that like um. Uh, you sort of sit outside of the the KPIs and the yearly um, the yearly reporting and that with um, um, with your organisations and then these things like they're not like a one year or two year project there um, they could be like a five year decade project because um, um, yeah there there is a lot of building um, of relationships there and a lot of trust building that needs to be done um, but yeah I'm I'm I guess to go on Leslie's point um, very much um, even with my um, position um, as a, as an archives manager. Um, it's very much that I um, sort of sit on the periphery um, of um, of these projects in terms of um, that I'm, I'm just sort of uh, this um, uh, person with um, sort of a space for people to store data, um, be able to to um, take that data out whenever they are ready to do so, um, and um, and just there is sort of that um, uh, as a bit of a sort of a, like as Leslie mentioned a conduit um, and a resource in terms of. Um, between researchers and communities and and even other institutions as well actually um, I think that's also important is that um, uh, we do have a network of um, uh, different um, archives and institutions and we work together on various projects and um, rather than everyone uh, every one of us going to a community all at the same time or bombarding communities with a number of different projects that we sort of are sitting down and working together on that um, so for instance, yeah, had had tea with a with a colleague the other day, and they said, "Oh, by the way, you're working on this project up north here. We've got this um, we've got this these excellent resources there as well. Do you mind if you can um provide um, um provide a way of um getting that up there? So, um, it's definitely about working together on that and and letting and letting and and also being that sort of um, um, yeah, that sort of contact um that conduit in terms of um letting people know. Um, where other things uh, might be, um, and and um, connecting those and connecting those people together. Um, Lee, you touched on this, and this is a big part of your mahi. Um, there's a strong push for Indigenous communities to develop skills and knowledge around technology, so those digital capability, digital literacy skills. Um, so they can maintain authority and control over their knowledges and data. Um, how can those in open access communities go from being on the sidelines, cheering them on, to truly partnering with communities without the perception that we're, you know, like we are partners, but we don't want to be taking over? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It certainly um, relates to a lot of the work that I do currently uh, in our communities, um, particularly around digital literacy. Um, I think, um, and I guess it speaks to the, um, dare I say, it, the treaty claim that I've got in front of the tribunal at the moment. It really spotlights uh, digital inequities, should I say, that impact on Maori uh, communities in general. And one of those, uh, one of the things that we point out or spotlight in that claim is. Um, what they call the digital divide, and that's basically made up of three 
broad challenges, and that's I've already mentioned this, and I'll probably mention it again. But uh, the first one is access to affordable internet connectivity. The second one is access to computing equipment, not a phone, um, with data. <laughs> And the third one is digital literacy. So these are these are very real things, very real barriers that are preventing our Māori communities here today in a first world country from participating as citizens, from participating as citizens. Some might argue that an internet connection is actually a human right, much the same as power energy is a human right, should be a human right, right? So how uh, do we expect, or how does, how does the government expect us to participate as a global digital citizen if we don't have these tools. So I guess that's the foundation kind of challenge for us is it's not just digital literacy, it's accessibility, uh, it's uh, affordability uh, of internet connectivity, which is going to be, provide us with the ability to access all of this data, these tangwa, et cetera, and use these, utilize these platforms that we do want our people to use. We want our people to use these things because we know there's a lot of benefits and upside that they will receive from being able to access their uh, family heirlooms, uh, from being able to access whakapapa that's being stored within an institution that that has never seen the light of day, being able to access video and also imagery of our ancestors, um, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all very real and relevant examples of where I think digital and technology can enable accessibility um, for our communities on the ground, but, um, you know, how are we going to achieve that if we don't have a, a simple internet connection? Coming back to digital literacy, I mean, it's really, um, come for me, um, empowering our communities is comes through education. And education, of course, digital literacy is, is a form of education, right? So that's why we put a lot of work and time into creating uh, these educational opportunities, these educational mechanisms that will upskill our people in terms of digital literacy. Because I feel, well, I actually I know that for a fact that without the digital literacy school sets, our people won't, won't be able to participate. They won't be able to use these solutions that we're, that we're partnering with them to design uh, or co-design, should I say. So yeah, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing, but I think um, empowering our communities through digital literacy will will be um, will help them. Um, yeah, will help them. I guess. Leslie, when you go out onto country, do you do you come across similar issues around those kind of three big issues around access and skills and? Most definitely, totally agree with Lee. That's been the last 11 years of challenges working with Indigenous remote communities and being advocates and advocating for proper in infrastructure, working with government agencies to put financial resources into these communities for infrastructures like don't even talk to me about that project because they don't even have the infrastructure to be able to participate so we talk about digital literacy digital skills and and then you know add on technology and then the money to actually sustain and manage that technology, like licensing agreements on digital platforms, digital software, um, all of those issues, it's like Lee was saying, is putting the, you know, chicken before the egg. Um, in the Torres Strait, there are 10 Indigenous knowledge centres that one council has to manage financially and the bandwidth to open up a general library catalogue with images, do you know how much bandwidth that chews up and how much money that costs councils to actually provide that service? So with the projects that are delivered um, with any technology, the first thing is looking at the infrastructure, looking at technology and the maintenance and sustainability of technology before you even look at digital literacy skills. And that is um, always been the challenge um, around um, providing 
even access to collections, the collections on country project, I've said everything needs to work without a, a internet co um, connection. Everything has to be downloaded. Technology has to be um, simple, yet cost effective, yet efficient. Um, and be able to be portable and durable. So the kids can take it outside, elders can take it outside and sit under a tree and listen to language recordings. They don't have to be stuck in four walls to actually access their own um, history. So when I always hear about developing skills around digital literacy, there's so much more that needs to happen before we even get to that point. Thanks very much, Leslie. It's it's really important to kind of relate it back to the lived experience of the communities that they that we're working with. And you know, there is a big. We're very fortunate. Most of us live in big urban centres, and are attached to cultural institutions where we do have really good access. But it's not everybody's reality. So, Ryan, in terms of you, you touched on in one of your earlier questions about training. What sort of training do you do for community around using your archives? Um, it's very much sitting down and having conversations around, um, uh, like I think the, the points that Lee and, and Leslie have, have mentioned in terms of um, um, how, in, how to use um, uh, certain databases or resources, um, those basic library literacy skills, um, uh, the um, uh, at the same time um, in terms of rolling out infrastructure um, and um, and solutions there as well is about um, how to maintain that um, how to look after that um, and what needs to be done there and um, yeah and I think that goes down to that main point around um, yeah the chicken and egg <laughs> scenario in terms of that um, I, I think I think I do resonate quite a lot with um, <laughs> with Leslie and Lee's points around. Um, sometimes you need to be a little bit low tech as well, um, and and sometimes the um, the the simplest um, solution, which might be a hard drive and um, and and a book um, with everything in there from from a particular collection or um, or resource, that sometimes is often the best solution because um, like a lot of the learning happens right on the spot in country. It's not as as Elizabeth, as Elizabeth mentioned in four walls in a. Um, in, in a building, it's it's out out in the middle of that, and and that's usually sometimes the best solution there. So, um, yeah, so it's very much um yeah down to all that um, uh, but also um yeah just sort of provide and I think the other point to make is um yeah providing those resources and um and making those available there as well and and how to use those resources effectively. So, um, it's very much those conversations there, and and um and sometimes I think it's around um that strategic um. Uh, strategic thing as well because um, often in communities there's always a couple of people that are always quite keen on learning um, and that you start with them and that sort of grows out from there as well and um, yeah so I think that's um, yeah that's very much it from um, from my end of things in terms of that is just very much yeah you, um, you you start off with the basics and you sort of build up from there. Um, while Indigenous communities are being encouraged to build digital knowledges and move to digital platforms, and we've talked about some of the challenges of that, if you think about some of the projects that you've worked on where you have built capacity, um, are, how are communities prepared for the the impact of those or the the changes that they were gonna have they will have on their life and culture. So it's it's like um you know you introduce this new thing and then it will have impacts in a life after you go. So is is that kind of that um foundation or preparing for what comes after you know these these digital um, platforms are out in community or digital uh, well, knowledges are given back to community so what sort of preparation or thought goes into that part of the project so after you've left after you've built something you've given it back and you've left what happens next I might just throw that open to the first person who wants to answer it 
I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll let out if you, if you don't, if you don't, if you guys don't mind. But um, if I could just make reference to the the project that that we um, helped to deliver, uh, which essentially was delivering digital literacy workshops and and programs into our Marae communities um, uh, and to Marae trustees, trustees of those Marae um, organisations or or, or or communities. Um, who, by the way, are largely our whaumatua or our elders. Um, so there's the generation gap, gap thing as well. But I think for me, and knowing off the back of, of, all, of, of all of that work, um, you know, the, the foundation, I guess, is is really upskilling through education, digital literacy. Again, I've said these things before, but I've seen the power of it. Um, you know, when you, when you show your people how to do things or how, how these things work, and the light turns on, it's a pretty amazing thing to experience and to see. Um, because our people are very capable. It's not it's not like, you know, they don't know how to do these things. They just, they just need to be shown how to do these things, how to become more digitally literate. Now, an, another powerful thing that, that we have enacted, I guess, through that work is um, it's, it's nothing quite like having people your own people show you how to do these things. So that's the other thing, right? So not only do it from an indigenous, uh, looking at it through a cultural lens, um, you're also delivering to your own people. Um, so immediately the trust um, is, you know, is kind of, you get, you get to a trust, high trust point very quickly because culturally you um, you know it all. So you, you're, you're already prepared for it, you're in it. And so we've seen the power of that as well. So having our own people going out to deliver these whatever they are, workshops, et cetera, getting them to a point there where they become um, a little bit more confident. And then once you unlock that, once the confidence comes, the conversation comes, the discussion comes, and it becomes really robust conversation about topics like cybersecurity, how to stay, stay safe online, artificial intelligence, what the heck is that, you know? Um, and, 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 and data sovereignty. So all of these really chunky, juicy, uh, technological challenges that that I, I myself as a practitioner and others on the call no doubt you know these are things of our everyday lexicon we talk about these things all the time but it's quite different at a community level so, um, so I guess coming back to what the point I'm trying to make is again empowering our communities on the ground through education is really really important because we need to build up that foundation knowledge that our communities have our people have so that then they can then start having discussions about, um, you know, more important subjects. But you can't get there without building up, without without scaffolding into it, right? If you have to build that foundation knowledge first, which will then enable you to springboard off into all of these cool and really exciting, really important conversations that we all need to have as community. So. Thanks very much, Lee. Um, Leslie or Ryan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, um, I have watched some communities over the years, you know, start from a, the, I want to build my local history collection to having a fully blown local history collection where they actually can do family um, history inquiries on community using um, copies of collections that are held in other parts of Australia and watching that journey of communities say to, to me, I have this vision, this is what I want to provide in my community library to watching those skills being developed, identifying you know, digitisation kits, providing the experts to come in and work with community to provide that education and training to seeing community digitising their collections, that they're contacting every institution in Australia, getting copies rematriated back to community, setting up the digital archives on community and now, you know, having a, a living archive that no matter where you are in Australia, people from that community can ring up and actually access 
family history. So watching communities grow in that space um, and the key with with building digital platforms for conversations and with having communities always around sustainability. It's about having that career pathway for the younger generations to come in to learn who's going to look after this collection in 20 years. So not only human resource, but also the actual um, sustainability of the technology. What happens when this format goes goes out? What, like right through to backing up, having multiple copies, it's always about the sustainability, leaving that legacy of that collection so it still can be accessed in 50 years' time. Um, and I think watching communities grow like that has been... Um, so positive and it, it motivates me to continue to, to work in this space. I always get my inspiration um, from community, from their aspirations um, to be able to then inform um, libraries, okay, this is the community's priorities in terms of these digital platforms. I mean, this is a sort of side question, but I mean, what it leads me to think about, Leslie, is um, do we need more people from our communities that to work in the glam sector? Is that one of the answers, or is it just teaching teaching in community that um, that being the kaitiaki or being the carers of the knowledge can be done? You, like, you don't have to work in the glam sector. Like, I think it's I'm talking around myself and sort of go, it's probably a combination of both things, right? Because we definitely want many more Indigenous people in the glam sector, but we need people in community that don't have to say they're an archivist or a librarian that understands what community needs. Anyway, that's, that's just a question to anybody that wants. Do you have a magic answer to that one? <laughs> that's so true, Kim, because there is a balance. Um, you do need... Yes, you don't need to work in the glam sector, but it's helped me to understand what communities needs and individuals needs are. And um, I've been talking to a lot of academic libraries about you can't do this work without us. So if you do not have the resources to hire Indigenous staff just yet, you need to set up an Indigenous governance framework that will provide that advice and guidance because we have this saying, and Ryan knows it, but this saying is nothing about us without us, and that's happened for far too long. So I'm a big advocate and would love to see more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people working in the GLAM sector because historically... There hasn't been, and there are so many records and knowledges and material in these collecting institutions that need that guidance, whether it be an external Indigenous governance framework or Indigenous people working in the collecting institutions, but my ultimate aspiration is collecting institutions, embedding Indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing as their BAU when they're dealing with Indigenous cultural heritage material. Ryan, do you have anything to add? I think after what Leslie said, I don't think I'll be able to <laughs> do any more justice on that. I think that was really great from both Lee and Leslie. Um, but yeah, I think I think to expand on some points as well, like um, especially like when you are starting off, um, um, or you're um, and like I found myself usually in a, like a lot of positions I that I was in um in previous roles, being the single person in an organisation who identified um as Aboriginal. Um, uh, sometimes as well, like um, if an organisation um you're unable to to bring um 
um, a staff member in from the land sector because um, we often um, the often conversation comes up saying there's a, it's a very very small population of us um, who work in um, in glam and um, and in this sector um, and we're a very small sector to begin with as well so that just sort of gives you an idea around that scale um, bringing bringing in people from from outside and and just bringing people to the table to have conversations is is the important thing. Um, um, part of our governance structure with our CEDA is that we have a reference group. Um, that's uh, we have few library professionals on there, um, archive professionals, researchers, but we also have um, um, but we also try and get community in as well, um, elders and that as well. Um, and I think it's important that you do have you do come into that with with your ears open um, and your heart open and your mind open as well, because um, uh, I think often with those kinds of groups. Um, um, especially if you call them like an advisory group or something like that, is that you can ignore the advice. Um, it's, it's um, if you are looking at something like that, you do need to have that framework in place to say that these are people that are making recommendations. This is sort of your um, your directional point in terms of making sure that what you, the business that you're doing is right. Um, so, um, and I think that's sort of a yeah, mixture of um, having people within your organisation, but then also external people um, who are able to have that cross sort of a critical view, like, um, like for instance, with Lee, um, being outside of um, an organisation um, and outside of that glam sector, um, being able to provide that unique perspective to things as well. Um, and I think that's always important to us, have that diversity of views and, um, and viewpoints um, and being able to have that as a as your sort of solid base for making decisions. Um, I don't think we can have a panel uh, in the current climate without mentioning AI. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> I'm going to mention it. Um, it's interesting when we're talking about the digital divide, but there's also a real need for our communities to understand or start to understand the impact that AI is going to have on the world around them. And it's not only what it does with our data, but it's, it's about how we interact with it um, how it's going to change the job market, all sorts of things. So I'm really interested in um, if you're already talking to communities about AI and what those conversations look like. Um, is it, Are you coming at it from a training perspective? Are you using it in your work? Um, do you think it's going to make a difference to your work? Um, so I might just throw that to Lee first since he is working in this space and then we can um, open it up to the rest of the panel. Yeah, thanks, Kim. And that is a very um, a relevant question uh, of, the t of today anyway. So I think just to provide a, a bit of context, um, I, I through, the, through the work that I do as an advocate and leader in the Māori Digitech community, um, obviously supporting our practitioners or, or people that are actually working and doing the do, but also there's the other side of that, which is supporting our, um, our, our communities in general um, through uh, empowering them through digital literacy and other really cool um, uh, initiatives as well. But I think for me, again, it comes back to education. <laughs> like, it, honestly, there really is no, for me, at the, at the community level, there is really no point trying to understand what tools you can use if you don't understand the basics of artificial intelligence. And I recently um, did a, a op ed or opinion piece uh, in one of the, in one of the uh, 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 media uh, outlets here a couple of months ago, and I talked about this thing called the double, uh, double digital skills gap. Essentially, there's a gap in both the understanding of the basics, which is the first gap, which further prevents people or our people from using AI, which is the second gap. So um so that being said also involved as a advisor on the uh, Māori advisory panel for what they call the ai forum nz so that's a it's another level different level but a kind of governance kind of advisory but you know to me the the, the world that our people live in on the ground in the communities and the world that you know some of us operate up here is is is, is, is it's so huge the gap is so huge that i i just you know, so so just imagine that in your mind, the gap is, is huge. We've got a massive uh, chasm of uh, a knowledge gap, if you like, where 
our people don't understand what artificial intelligence is and i feel that we need to get them or upskill them into a position or a place where they have that foundational knowledge and this is exactly the reason why my concerns for our communities um led me to um uh, reach out to a good friend of mine dr kaitiana taudu who's one of our foremost uh voices i guess or, or common commentators on on the subjects of data sovereignty but also machine learning and artificial intelligence and so he and i got together um throughout through our click a combined concern for our communities who have this knowledge gap and we created this thing called kete ai essentially it's an online free freely accessible resource that we've curated it's information credible information that we've curated and pulled together in one place so that our people our communities can see it access it and start taking it start their journey on this education journey right this learning journey because um, we saw with the proliferation of uh, cryptocurrency which was which wasn't that long ago by the way but um things like emerging technologies emerging and disruptive technologies like blockchain cryptocurrency and now artificial intelligence they uh, they impact on our um, indigenous and mi minority communities more so than other communities so that's a real risk and that's a real problem so so coming back to ai same thing give our people the, the education and the tools that they need to understand it at a foundational level and then let them take that journey. Um, I guess the other thing around AI is um, taking our, um, our knowledges and manipulating them or misusing them in ways that are not culturally appropriate. And I wonder if um, anyone has had any experience of that. I certainly know creative um, friends who have been very upset by the fact that this is happening to their work that is um, tupuna led or based on um, their uh, ancestral knowledge um, being manipulated by AI. And it's another area that we as um, custodians of knowledge um, need to be mindful of and I'm just wondering if any of the panel have had any experience or um, have any advice for community dealing with these sort of things I guess um, the one thing um, I've started my journey on learning about AI um, and that's where I'm at at the moment is to be able to assist and provide advice and support to communities. I have to learn about it first. And it is something that I've had to grasp my head around the fact how it picks up information, um, how it will use it. Um, also being involved, Ryan and I, attended workshops um, about AI and Indigenous knowledges and the risks around that. We even had a community presentation from, was it Barula, um, up in the top end, and they told us their community is not ready for AI. Their priorities is housing, infrastructure, you know, getting their kids to school on a road that you can't travel in, health, employment. And so every community is going to be different. Some communities are going to be ready to have that conversation and have that awareness and, and to have that um, training and education around AI. Um, the scary thing when I was learning about it is, you know, once the information is out there, it can't be redacted. Um, so if there's information out there now and someone does a, a cultural knowledge holder, finds it and says, oh, my goodness, that is women's business or that is men's business, um, that's relating to a secret ceremony, how do you redact that? That's the one key message that is stuck in my mind about having conversations with community about AI. And like everything, if it's used 
properly, respectfully, it can be an amazing tool. I can see some benefits for me as a person and for communities, but it has to be in a, it has to have controlled mechanisms. You know, I've been learning about these guardrails and um, these language management databases in how, you know, we protect Indigenous knowledges. Um, so I'm very early in this journey of learning AI and I've had to put my fear aside knowing that I will get left behind if I keep being ignorant and saying, look, this is for the younger generation. I have to arm myself with the information to be able to support communities and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who want to, to use this technology. Yeah, I think I'm very much in the same boat as well. Um, it's it's an area that I'm still learning now. Um, and uh, and again, um, like I think with some of the points um, that we've all made, like um, even if it's not, AI is not central and core to um, what a community wants to know about and, um, and address. Um, other, other things that are um, happening within community, there's an opportunity there for AI to, to be able to help with some of those solutions. So being able to track health metrics, being able to um, being able to use AI to um, to determine um, state of roads and being able to improve upon that, for instance. So there's, there's a really those opportunities for AI to help address those questions. And that's just um, uh, using um, using AI on sort of non um, non First Nations data sets and, and resources and that sort of um, in, uh, that easier interaction between um, between different government um, bodies and organisations and being able to collate that all together for it. So it's a really great opportunity there. Um, I think my, my, my two cents in this is really um, we need to be very much curatorial around what we put out um, onto open access now, um, particularly for collections. So often for a library, the easiest route um, to put resources and that up online is usually the older things. Um, and that's when we start getting those problems there where you start having outdated information and forming AI. Um, I think we need to very much, I think one thing around that is to encourage new knowledge to be made available. Um, we've got some really great deadly academics and researchers um, that are doing a lot of great work out there and being able to sort of promote that, make that available and help inform those AI models. Um, I think that's where we need to go is to sort of um, I guess sort of take control of AI there and and again like we've what we've always done is pretty much saying like what we what do we want to feed into these um into these models and um how do we want that direction to go for it so um I think it's around us being very much um sort of providing more information into that provided that it's done appropriately we don't want obviously culturally sensitive information going into there but if there's things that we are able to sort of be able to sort of switch over um, I think I think that's where we need to go for that um, there. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, I'm going to ask some of the questions from uh, Slido now. Um, and the first one is to Ryan. Um, what kind of link and collaboration does your archive have with the Australian Research Data Commons uh, and the data uh, alliance, etc. <laughs> um, I think it's like any other peak body. We um we we do keep um we keep tabs um on them. Uh, I know that ARDC is doing a lot of work in this space at the moment with Indigenous research data. Um, building a framework around that and a national framework for us to all work from. Um, I think like us um and a lot of other um organisations um out there, we're sort of um. Uh, just sort of keeping our finger on the um, our finger on the pulse in terms of um, what's happening in that space, um, where we can be involved in with conversations and that. So um, um, often you see me lurking in a couple of those meetings there, just finding out what's going on, where where directions are in that, and um, and how we can be able to contribute for it. Um, uh, yeah, so we we also um, uh, work a little bit with the Research Data Alliance. Again, we're sort of um, um, an interest party. Um, uh, in that, like with any other archive, um, and, and that is about just contributing to those conversations and that 
Um, we have a bit more of a closer um, relationship with the ARDC, not directly through the um, Indigenous um, uh, the Indigenous um, uh, pillar there, but um, uh, we do work with quite closely with colleagues um, here, so we often get updates and, and we're often providing advice through that. So um, we have a little working relationship there for that. But, um, Fantastic. Thank you for that uh, answer. Um, this one's for Lee. Uh, is Aotearoa New Zealand's government actively calling for submissions um, to government inquiries on digital infrastructure, AI, and digital sovereignty concerns? <laughs> and if so, how do you contribute to those things? <laughs> yeah, that's a really great question. And, and like, honestly, um, I, I have a pretty good helicopter snapshot of what's going on at the moment um, in relation to that question. But what I will say is that um, obviously I don't know um, what 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 the detail of, 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 of what could be sitting behind um, that work. But what I can say is that there's, a, there's many of us that are contributing in different ways, whether that be researching into um, the uh, necessity for affordable internet connectivity, whether that be um, you know, also creating mechanisms and opportunities for um, career and employment pathways to ensure that we're um, and pathwaying the next generation into this, because um, then that's, that's, your, that's your resourcing, that's your succession, that's your um, future um, leaders, that's your uh, future uh, design uh, solution designers as well, right? So that's an important important thing as well. But I don't think there's enough work being done by, by this current government um, uh, in relation to that very question. That's my answer. <laughs> and I can say that with pretty pretty high uh, level of confidence. And I think that really just speaks to the work that we do, myself and other uh, leaders and advocates in this in this very small uh, Māori tech, tech community. You know, we're really just trying to bring um, um, uh, bring a voice to some of these uh, issues and some of these challenges. Uh, digital infrastructure, whether that's, whether that's digital infrastructure, whether that's digital sovereignty, there are some organisations and groups, I will shout out to to Kahui Raranga that have led out um, kind of a lot of the work around and discussion around Māori data sovereignty in particular, which actually was born, spun out of uh, the University of Waikato, the, uh, the founders, uh, Dr. Tahu Kukutai and also Dr. Māori Hudson, that's a really important foundational groundwork that has led on to help us to navigate this thing that we call Māori data sovereignty here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which has then turned to do partnerships and also relationships with the government. So you know, those are really important, um, I guess, examples of the work that um, some of us um, have been doing to ensure that you know, some of these really important challenges that, that I see all the time, um, but that many don't see um, are addressed and therefore, um, um, you know, adequately resourced, if you like, <laughs> by our by the by the current government. So yeah, I'm not sure, really sure that actually answers the question, but I'm, yeah, hopefully that gives you some insight. <laughs> Thank you. So we've actually come to the end of our time. I th I thought um, it was a beautiful discussion um, and grounded in lived experience of people that are working in community with indigenous knowledges. And there's a nice nexus between, um, you know, uh, working for a collecting organisation and um, working to build capacity in our communities. So um, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm just going to give you like about 10 seconds each if there's one final thought that you would like to leave people with about... Um, about your mahi and what, or your work, and what is the most important thing to you um, as an Indigenous person working in this space? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I just, uh, firstly, I just wanted to acknowledge my uh, fellow panellists, um, Ryan and Leslie. Thank you very much for sharing your matauranga, your knowledge with myself, but also with those on the call. I don't have a, I don't have a challenge or wero per se to, to put out there, but I would love to see more cross-Tasman Indigenous collaboration in this space. I'm not saying that there aren't already those uh, kind of organisations or mechanisms in place, but certainly from a 
from a Maori tech practitioner's perspective, you know, we've got a whole bunch of people behind me and around me that have the expertise that can lend their expertise to some of your um, 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 counterparts over there across, across the Tasman. So I'd love for there to be some sort of collaboration whereby we can help to each other to, to design some of these solutions that are needed. Kia ora. I think for me, um, I love this work. It is my passion. I have found so many other family history pertaining to both sides of my family, but the one thing that never fades is the emotion I feel when I show someone a photograph or language that they've never seen from their ancestor. That is my passion and I don't think I will ever lose that drive and emotion to connect people to these um, collections. What I tell my non-Indigenous colleagues and people working in this space is don't put this work in the too hard basket. It is don't focus on that big mountain in front of you. Focus on your feet and the steps that you take that are in front of you. Because if you constantly look at that top of that mountain, you will, you won't climb it. So this work may be challenging, but it's also rewarding. And don't do it on your own. Do not work in silos. Partnership, collaboration, that's how Indigenous people work. We work on an Aboriginal relationality framework. That's how this work gets done. And thank you for all the work that you currently do in your organisations. Thanks very much, Leslie. Ryan. Hmm. Um, I often go back to to a word, Rodri word, um, yindi um, um respectful listening and um, and learning and taking time. Um, I think that's that's my takeaway from all it. Um, and um, and and usually what I how I follow on that, I think it's just um, you take the time, um, uh, learn and like um, and um, and connect with people. Um, I think and I think a lot of these um, issues like uh, and challenges. Um, like again, um, it, they may seem quite large, but I think if we come together like on forums like this and we talk and have discussions, um, I think that's um, that's that's where we can learn and um, and be able to do some really great work around that. Um, I think is um, and and I think the most I get like I think what really sustains me is um, collaborating with people, having those conversations, um, and working together. Like um, like I think we've all said, don't work in those silos. <laughs> um, uh, connect um connect with people connect with connect with country learn from country um and um and and learn from each other um and I guess just to um follow up with Lee um to to say thank you for bringing us together today Kim and Janet um and the guys at the um Open Access Australasia um and um being able to have this uh this uh platform to be able to have these discussions today. Um, on that note, I want to thank uh, the audience for coming along today. Um, there's been lots of uh, warmth and support um, in the chat. I've been watching that as you've all been speaking. Um, people have certainly been um, moved and appreciate your uh, openness and honesty about the, um, the beautiful things about the work, but also the ongoing challenges. And so I would like to thank you for that. I'm going to hand it back to uh, Janet for a couple of closing things, and then I'll finish with a karakia. Thank you, Kim. And uh, many, many thanks to our panelists today. It's been a, a really, really uplifting, inspiring uh, conversation to listen to. And uh, uh, it's been a privilege to be involved in organizing this session. So thank you very much. And big thanks to Kim for um, steering the conversation. Uh, also, I wanted to say thanks to uh, Garth Smith on the call, because he's been the uh, co-organizer of this session as well. He's been beavering away in the background <laughs> without um, 
you know, without people seeing him, but he's been working hard on the session all the way through as well. So thank you. The Open Access Planning Committee for 2024. Uh, I won't name everyone. It is listed on our website, but um, thanks as always for uh, volunteering your time to put these events together and a very big thanks to our um, audience for all the events this week. Uh, thank you to everyone. And um, yeah, I think uh, if we can just close up uh, in the right way, Kim, and then uh, we'll get on with our days. Thank you. Um, so this karakia is about moving all the restrictions aside um, and clearing the pathway so you can return with this uh, wonderful warm feeling back into your days. So uh, me i noi tātou, ki a whakaeria te tapu, ki a watia ai te ara, ki a tūriki whakataha ai, ki a tūriki whakataha ai, haumie, huie, tāikie. Mātua, thank you. <laughs>